Okay, everybody, this is Jay Papasan. Welcome to our monthly webinar for The One Thing. Super excited to have so many people here for a really awesome message. This month, our guest is John O'Leary, um, the author of an instant bestseller, um, On Fire, The Seven Choices to Ignite a Radically Inspired Life, which tells his story, which is truly amazing. Um, as I was mentioning before we started, um, I've gotten the privilege of seeing him deliver this message live. Um, we have staffers here when we heard that he was going to be on this program. We're super excited um, that we were going to get to hear this message again. It's very inspirational. It'll definitely cause you to pause and take a look at what you think is trouble in your own life and how you respond to it. And hopefully we'll all walk out of here stronger and inspired to live our lives on fire. Um, I love the message, love the speaker, and super excited to share it with you. Some housekeeping before we get started. Um, on the screen, you can see all of our um, Twitter handles. Um, if you want to you know, share it throughout, obviously we love it when you share the one thing message um, and when you tag it, I definitely circle back to that after these webinars. And if we miss someone, it gives me a chance to connect and I'm sure John will do the same. Um, the one thing for your life on fire with John O'Leary. Um, if you wanna find out more about him, we'll show this again later. Um, John O'Leary inspires.com is where you can find out all about him. But before we dive into his message, I'm going to give you the usual quick rundown. How does this book connect to his message? Why is he a guest here? And if you're new to the one thing, kind of what's the big idea? Um, the big idea of the one thing is how we can actually live more in our priorities. When we identify the things that matter most, it allows us to say no to everything else, all the distractions. And this kind of gets us to this place where ultimately we want to live the 80-20 principle, right? 20% of our efforts gives us 80% of our results. The numbers really can fill out the window because when you keep taking the 20% of the 20% of the 20%, you always come back to one thing. What is the one prime activity, the lead domino, the catalyst for your health, for your job, for your spiritual happiness? And have you made a stand around making that activity happen? That's really it, the big idea. And obviously, we go into a lot of how we live that and what, how we avoid stumbling. I'm going to jump just a little bit ahead here because I want to get to John's message. But we apply that to the different areas of our life, you know, your spiritual life, your physical health, your personal life, your key relationships, job, business, finances. Those are the big areas that you want to take this one thing principle and, and, and actually roll it out in your life. This month, I'm going to tell you that we're kind of living in your personal life. This is a conversation you have with yourself. It's a conversation about whether you're going to own the outcomes in your own life and you're going to be the author of them or the victim of them. And this is the dialogue that you get to have. And what's the one thing that you can do to live your life on fire? We believe it's about the accountability cycle. And I referenced this when we were kind of getting started. Um, it's one of the three commitments people make to extraordinary results. They get on the path of mastery. They move from E to P, which is about being purposeful instead of just entrepreneurial. You're not chasing ideas. You're looking for best practices. But the final and absolutely the most important step is to live what we call the accountability cycle. And when I was preparing for this today, I went back and reread this section. Um, it's hugely important. So I'm going to give you the big idea, and I'm sure this will come up in, in our chat with John in just a couple of moments. But when life happens, how do you respond? And the reality is no one is totally accountable and no one is totally a victim. It's just how we respond in the moment. And the more habitual we become in being accountable to when life happens, the more accountable we live our lives. So let's just look at those two things. Life happens. And this can be as small as a friend was sharing a story about his Wi-Fi going out when he needed to spend, send some important emails for work and how it kind of threw his evening for a loop, like driving to Starbucks, yelling at people driving slow in front of him. And he realized at that moment he totally didn't respond well to just a speed bump. And it caused him to pause and take, take, take a bigger look at his life. And then there's people that respond to really big things like John's going to tell us, a major life event, a tragedy, in fact. But if you respond with accountability, it's different. So life happens in your life. The victim follows like this. They avoid reality. They don't ask any questions, right? They just say, oh, no. They fight reality. And they'll say, that's not reality or that's not true, right? Denial, right, is one of the classic steps. Then they move to blame. 
You know, if everybody would just do their job or if so-and-so had just done something different, right? It's not about them. It's about what other people are doing. And then they have personal excuses, right? Well, it isn't my job. It is their responsibility. They're moving the responsibility for what's happening in their life to someone else. And then they wait and hope. And you've heard people say this. If it was meant to be, it'll happen. That's pretty much wishing, right, folks? That's not how big things happen in our life. Well, let's flip that coin. And we've all lived on this side of ledger, too. When reality happens, right, you just ask the question, okay, what just happened? You acknowledge reality. Wow, okay, that just happened. That's not good. But then you own it. All right, well, if it's to be, it's up to me. Now, that's a huge phrase, right? You're taking personal responsibility for something that may have just happened to you. And that's just something that really amazing people do on a regular basis. Because then they, the moment they take accountability for it, they own it, they can ask the question, well, what can I do to change this situation? And then get on with it. You know, I used to joke, um, I get the privilege of working with a woman named Mary Tennant. She was our past president, and she was easily the most accountable human being I've ever been around. She would have taken ownership of a comet flying out of space and hitting her in the head. She would have just said, I shouldn't have been standing there. Doesn't matter how crazy it was, she's going to find her role in the situation because in the moment she does that, she can own the outcomes for the future. So the big takeaway here before we go to John is take ownership of whatever happens in your life. Never put your happiness or your future at anyone else's feet but your own. And if you can take ownership, then you can respond and change the outcomes in your life. It's a huge lesson. It's one we get to keep learning again and again and again. And we're about to learn some more today from John. If you haven't heard John's story, it's truly remarkable. Um, it's absolutely, as a parent, heartrending for me. In 1987, when John was nine years old, um, he decided to play with fire and gasoline. Um, two things that, as adults, we know don't mix well, especially in a closed environment. He created a huge explosion and was burnt virtually over 100% of his body. He was given essentially no chance to live. Um, what they do, as the way I remember reading from the book, is they take your age and they take the percent of your body that was burnt, and that becomes the percentage for a fatal outcome. So if it was 90% and you were nine years old, there was a 99% chance that you would die. He virtually went over 100 and somehow, some way, and he's going to share the story with us, overcame what seemed like insurmountable odds to survive a horrible, horrible accident. This story was originally shared by his parents. They wrote a book called Overwhelming Odds in 2006. And that first printing of 200 blossomed into over 60,000 copies being sold. And that, through a series of stories, which hopefully John will share with us today, um, inspired him to take personal ownership of telling that story. And part of it is the book that we'll reference a couple of times. If you haven't gotten On Fire, um, his book, it's a bestseller on Amazon. It's a great title. It's a quick, inspirational read. Definitely encourage you to check it out. That's not, you know, John's like, I don't want you here to sell the book, but I'm going to, because I think it's a great way to internalize this message, but definitely tells the story in great detail. Um, it's number one bestseller. Um, he's an extraordinary speaker. All of his business comes by referral because when people hear his message, they just want to hear it again. So without further ado, John, if you're on the call, would you unmute yourself and, and just say hello to everybody? Jay, I'm on the call and delighted to be here with you. Man, thank you. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I know Vicki thanks you as well. She was your host when you joined us with KW. And, you know, we've had a couple of moments while we were reviewing your work and preparing for this where she was just reliving um, your message. So really quickly, um, I gave probably the poorest rendition because I was trying to get to you, right? Can you take us back to the beginning? You know, I've got kind of our agenda on screen for people to see kind of some points that we want to go through about accountability, yes. the power of one and pursuit of significance. Why don't you go back to the beginning? Where does this story begin? Yeah, so I mean, it begins with a normal kid growing up in the Midwest with normal parents and normal friends and a normal life who earlier in the week had seen some normal kids, 11-year-olds, playing with fire and gasoline. And I assume, Jay, if they could do it, you know, monkey see, monkey do, the next line, of course, is so can I. 
and I think this is powerful because we do this to those around us. We follow those around us, and we assume if they can do this for better and for worse, that we can also do the same. So it's really important in life when we are living out our one life that we follow those around us who we can look up to, that we can want to be more like. But on a Saturday morning with my dad at work and my mother out, the house was mine. Yeah, I walked into the garage over to a can of gasoline, bent down next to it, the plan was to pour a tiny bit of gasoline on top of a burning piece of paper. And I would imagine right now the ladies are on the call thinking, oh my gosh, well, what is wrong with this guy? And all the men are leaning back thinking, oh my gosh, I wonder if he put the G.I. Joe guys in first or second. <laughs> because what we all know is little boys are crazy. They're crazy at seven, they're crazy at nine, they're crazy beyond. Before the liquid came out, Jay, the fumes came out of the can of gasoline. I, th I think you guys even might have a picture of it. This can of gasoline created a massive explosion. I, th I think it's important that we realize this is not just a fire story we're talking about right now. It's a life story. It's a leadership example. In life, it's seldom the liquid that burns us. It's almost always the vapor. It mm. It's the fumes. It's the stuff of life that we're too busy too preoccupied, too wrapped up in to really notice that brings us down. It, it's not the liquid, it's the vapor. And that day what got me, and I think most days what gets us are those darn vapors. For me, it created a mighty explosion, split the can in two, as you can see. Yeah, it looks and like the bottom got blown feet. off of it. It just, ugh. Hey, John, are you still there? I'm not hearing you. Oh. I am still here, my friend. Okay, I'm sorry. You cut out for a second. I just said I interrupted you. I mean, I'm looking at the picture on the screen, and it looks like literally the bottom blew out of it. It was such a powerful explosion. Or was it split in half? I Yeah, it's both. You know, So it, it did split in half, and uh, it was so powerful that it actually blasted windows out of my neighbor's house. They live several hundred feet away. So it, it was a mighty, mighty, mighty explosion. Can you hear? Hey, John. Jay, can you hear? Yeah, are I you hearing this now? Okay. But yeah, you're cutting out. So maybe we need to go to the straight microphone. Sorry about that. Can you start over? It blew out windows a hundred feet away. Yeah, exactly. It blew the windows out a hundred feet away in, in a neighbor's house, and uh, like I said earlier, launched me twenty feet against the far side of the garage. When we were little, Jay, we were taught and trained what to do when we're on fire and everyone can of course echo back the word stop drop and roll right but when you're little and you're scared you don't stop and drop and roll you take off running and I think there's another rift we could take later on as well we train in our minds right we train up in our heads cognitive level but we lead and we live and we serve we buy and we sell ultimately from a much more sacred source and for me, and I think for all of us, I, I live from my heart. And so I think part of my goal on this call is that your leaders, your followers can realize the value of connecting their heads, what we know, to their hearts where they can take action. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and also, come on, you're a nine-year-old that's just experienced an explosion. I'm going to cut you some slack for not remembering the safety rules at that moment. My goodness. <laughs> Yeah, I appreciate that. I need some slack, both then and today. I, I'm shocked that it didn't knock you unconscious. I mean, that would be almost uh, have been a mercy on some level, but you retain consciousness through this entire thing. Yeah, so not only retain consciousness, Jay, but also uh, fully aware. It's one thing to be physically moving. It's another thing to have all these memories as your, your own. So these weren't reported to me later by siblings or family members or parents or the, the, the medical professionals in the hospital. I remember distinctly the explosion, distinctly being on fire and coming back through the flames, coming back into my mom and dad's house, standing on top of a rug, just screaming and burning and begging and praying for a hero, kind of yelling out, God, I'll take anybody. I'll take anybody. Uh, it really, going through the example you shared earlier, playing the role of victim, not having any clue how to own my life, how to take the next step forward for myself. And, and then I saw my 17-year-old year old brother, Jim, racing toward me. 
he was probably the last person in the world that I was hoping and praying for because he was my older brother. He had never done anything kind for me before this moment, before this day. <laughs> He's a typical 17-year-old brother, self-focused. Right. And yet this, this was his day to wake up, to change, to become a better version of himself. Uh, he, he grabbed this little rug laying there in the front hall, picked it up, and began beating me with it. It took him a couple minutes. He burned himself in the process, carried me outside, threw me on the grass, and saved my life. Mm. Uh, 1987, the lifesaver of the year for the state of Missouri, was an arrogant, self-centered, pimple-faced, freckle-faced, 17-year-old punk brother named Jim who changed and shined. I, I think change, Jay, is, is really hard to manage if it's about you. Mm -hmm. But if the change we seek is about significance, if it's about those around us, if it's about a cause greater than ourselves, I think we can not only seek and live into it, but we can sustain it long term. Mm. All right. So at this point, I'm going to put a picture of um, this is you, I assume, at nine years old. Um, yeah. At this point, he's put the fire out. I guess they're, they called the paramedics. What, what happens next? Yeah, so I mean, this this call out what everyone's staring at first, and I realize many of your followers are tuning in through a car so they can check it out when they get home. Right. But this is me in front of a Christmas tree. I'm about nine years old. If you look closely, you see a kid who uh, obviously is extremely good looking. I think that's <laughs> the first thing that jumps off this slide at me and, and the thousands of viewers and followers right now. I've clearly got a great haircut. I'm a great dresser. Life is good. And then life, as we all know, in real estate, in sales, in parenting, in life, in, in all aspects of our journey, life changes. It, it's the one guarantee, the one certainty. Mm -hmm. And so in a moment, I'm going to show you, and with your help, a picture of what it looks like moments later when I'm brought into the hospital. And, and for the viewers, the picture that is going to be on the screen will be extremely painful to look at. So some may want to avert their eyes or shut them for a moment. Yeah. But I found myself, as you suggested, with burns on 100% of my body, and 87% of those were third degree. So I'm, I'm showing the picture now, folks. Um, definitely avert your eyes if you, it's not something you care to see. It was tough for me as a parent to think about this for a child. Um, you're at this horrible place right now. Um, you remember all the details. What gave you hope? I mean, I, did you ever even give up hope during this journey? Yeah, so uh, when I was first brought into the room, Jay, the first thing I remember thinking, and it's so very vivid in my memory, and I can place myself back there 30 years ago, uh, the one thought for me, you talk about the one thing, for me, the one thing I was focused on was, oh my gosh, my dad is going to kill me when he finds out. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I, That's I, a it's nine year old so thought, clear right? to me. Yeah. Oh, man. I, played with gasoline. I blew myself up. I think I ruined the house in the garage. I mean, my old man is going to kill me. And so that was the voice that I heard. And if you want to advance uh, to the picture of my mom and dad, that was the voice of fear. It was the one thing I was completely focused on, which is really in life the one thing we should not be focused on. We should not live from a place of fear. But as a kid, that's where I was. And then I hear my, my father's voice down the hall yelling at one of the nurses. Uh, where is my boy John? And and I remember hearing that voice echoing back toward me like a like a lion's roar. And as a kid, I remember thinking, "Oh my gosh, the old man has come to finish me off." I mean, th th this dude is so mad. I could tell in the sound of his voice. This nurse does me no favors, Jay. She brings him back into the room. He pulls back the curtain. The old guy walks over to me, points down. And then very distinctly says to me, very loudly and very clearly, John, look at me. And so I look up at my father, and then he says, I have never been so proud of anybody in my entire life. And my little buddy, today, this morning, I'm just proud to be your dad. Hmm. And then he says, I love you, I love you, I love you. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, uh, nobody told my dad what happened. You know, I mean, he, he must not know. 
for the, the listeners, though, I have a feeling uh, each of you, including you, Jay, knows that, of course, my father knows what yeah. happened. He was, I'm sure, disappointed and sad and brokenhearted when he found out how it all went down. But once he pulled back that curtain, once he lost his breath, he had that same joy she put in front of us earlier, this idea of being accountable or being a victim to it. My dad boldly, faithfully, lovingly stepped into that room. He changed. He became on fire with love. He changed, and I followed. It, it was one of the turning points in my story, and it's one that he led me partially the way toward, but it was my mother who kind of finished me off. So if, if, if I may finish the, the yeah. story quickly with my mom, yeah. she, she walks into the room. She takes my hand. She pats my bald head. She again tells me she loves me. She loves me. And uh, I remember thinking, gosh, now it must be serious because it's not about the house anymore. Yeah. So I look up at my mom and say, Mom, knock it off with the love. Am, am I going to die? Am I going to die? And when I asked the question, I was just looking for hope and reassurance. And instead, this wonderful lady gave me something more important than either. She gave me truth grounded in love. She looked me in the eyes, and Jay, she asked me a question that I think changed my life as a kid and continues to change my life as a man. The, the question she asked was, baby, do you want to die? It's mm -hmm. your choice. It's not mine. You, you put up that slide earlier where you, you wrote, life happens. Uh, yeah, indeed, life happens. But for a middle-class Midwestern kid, life had always happened for me. I went to church on Sundays because my mom and dad had the, the khaki pants pressed and ready to go. I ate breakfast because they made me cereal. I went to school because they told me when to be there. I mean, life happened for me. And on this day when life was happening to me, this wonderful leader, the one on the left, guides me to the cliff edge, points down and says, this is one way to go. But there is an alternative path requiring an awful lot of accountability that you must choose. Left or right, life or death, your choice, not mine. And I remember saying back, Mama, I do not want to die. I want to live. Hmm. And her sage response, it's so appropriate as a kid, but even beautiful today, was good, baby, good. Then look at me. You take the hand of God. You walk the journey with him. But, baby, you fight like you have never, ever fought before. Your father and I will be with you every step along the way. But you must fight. And Jay, it's a moment in time uh, that changes everything that happens afterwards. It's a moment in time that shifts me from being a victim in many regards to being accountable to at least the next one thing that's in front of me, this choice to fight on. Well, your mom, I love this story. This is the part where I really went to underline craziness on your book too. And me and Vicky talked about this when we were preparing for this call quite a bit. That moment as parents, would we have had the courage to give our kids more than just love, but to give them ownership. Mm. And the gift of ownership, letting you know that you were in control and it was your choice, um, as tough as that choice was for someone to take, what a gift that was. And I know you reflect on that in many ways in the book, but I, that was a big moment for me. I'm so glad you shared it with us in detail because it took so much courage for her to put that choice at your feet. I mean, what if you'd said, no, I don't want to live, you know, uh, no doubt. she, she, she would have remembered that, that for the rest of her life. And she remembers it now in a positive way, but she gave you ownership and, um, what a gift that was. Well, and you said, I, I wonder with Vicky and who, by the way, Vicky's awesome. So if she's listening right now, I just I'm tell her I love you. her and there's nothing she can do about it. So my mother, I think the words ownership and love are actually in many regards, they're, they're tied to the same tree. Hmm. Uh, they, they are the same. My mother provided an awful lot of love by providing and challenging me to take on an awful lot of ownership. I think frequently we try to love our children or love our coworkers or love our clients or love whomever else by doing things for them, by bending over backwards, by making sure everybody gets the blue ribbon and everybody wins, all this stuff. And there's some value in making sure people feel appreciated and respected and loved. But at the end of the day, Real love is about setting people free to make their own decisions in life. And as difficult as it was, I can't even imagine, as a parent myself today of four, I cannot imagine being bold enough to ask that question. But I think it is the ultimate sign and signature of love. Well, I think that one of the reasons that you are a parent of four now is because she gave you that choice. I mean, you know, to come full circle there. Yeah, it's hard to imagine, but what a gift. 
So take us from here. All right. So you've been given this gift of ownership. Um, you had a, a mountain to climb that's just almost unfathomable, right? You know, I'm sure the doctors, like everybody was like, is this a hospice situation or is this a recovery right. situation? I mean, what? where do you go from here? So the beautiful thing, and, and you speak to this in, in the book, but it's it's taking it one day at a time. And the analogy we actually use in the hospital, and I did not write about it, so yours is perfect, was this notion of climbing a mountain. And we knew that there would be some valleys, some troughs, there would be some days where we saw no light, but we knew that we were going to peak, we were going to summit this thing together. And the dream that we had, I think it's so important in life to have dreams, the big dream we had was someday to climb this mountain collectively to get home, and actually the reward we were going to have once we achieved our goal was to, to take a family vacation out to Colorado, to climb mm -hmm. mountains out there together as a family. and. About 18 months after being burned, we hopped into a friend's big van. We drove 13 hours through the night. We woke up in Colorado, went up to Breckenridge, and this little boy with his five siblings and his mom and dad had these big, goofy grins because we had climbed this mountain that 18 months earlier we knew was a possibility. So it begins with this decision on the front side to fight on toward a worthy goal. Now, what does that require? It requires constant blood transfusions and donor sites, man, skin grafts, bandage changes, physical therapy. You need a respirator. You need a whole lot of medical care, a whole lot of spiritual care, a whole lot of prayers, a whole lot of support. But the front side of it was the de determination to fight on toward a worthy goal that we knew we would get to collectively. Mm. I love that. They gave you something to, to, to aim for, that idea in the future. That's cool. I imagine that was just amazing. To, to be there 18 months later. And it, only 18 months later also feels a little astounding. But I guess, I mean, it, was that a fast recovery or is that a normal? I mean, how, how long? I mean, 18 months, given the photo that we looked at earlier, feels almost miraculous to me. Yeah, well, I think the whole thing, candidly, is, is miraculous. And I understand when I was there 18 months old, earlier, later, I still had splints and still uh, looked very beat down, was occasionally in a wheelchair still, just start, still learning how to walk and ride and get after it in life. So yes, it was a miraculous recovery, but it was about an, as arduous an 18-month recovery that, I, that I've ever heard of because we went through dozens and dozens of surgeries, lost my fingers to amputation. 18 months of physical therapy and occupational therapy and speech therapy, a little bit of counseling mixed in. And yet what we also were blessed with was continuous guidance and encouragement from family, from friends, from the staff, from the community here in St. Louis, and from the global marketplace as a whole. Mm. President Reagan was writing letters that he and his wife Nancy were praying for us. We got a letter from Pope John Paul II in Rome. People from around the United States, from around the world, were championing this little boy and his family, encouraging them to realize they were not on their own. So that, that support and that encouragement and those prayers, I think, matter significantly. Mm. Well, you also had a, a special guest. I, I'm going to put a picture up here. I don't know where this is of you with the bandage on your head. I'm assuming yeah. this is on that path to recovery. And I just love when I saw this, like, you're still all bandaged up, but you got a smile on your face that feels absolutely <laughs> genuine. Uh, kind of amazing. You know, so that, that picture was taken the, the afternoon I came home from the hospital. Uh, so it, it, we, we'd been in the hospital for five months, and I think there's a, a cool story attached to this. But in the hospital for five months, my family surprised me by having this huge blowout party that day at home. The house had been rebuilt. People had volunteered their time and their treasure, their efforts to rebuild this thing for us. We now were celebrating reunion and life together as a family at home. So this picture was taken right before dinner, which is so relevant because that night my mom made my favorite dinner, which is all rotten potatoes and chicken breast. Weird kid, man. I still am a weird man, but that was my deal back then. I loved that cheesy goodness. So mom is at one corner of the table, my father's at the other, five siblings around it, and then a little boy with a white hat, as you see there, in a wheelchair. Smelled great, a lot of laughter, a lot of happy tears, and then the challenge is I can't eat. It's hard to say in that picture, but my fingers have been amputated, so I can't hold anything. Mm. My sister Amy, who I know is one of your listeners, she's a huge follower, she's a big fan, grabs a fork. She brings it toward my mouth with some potatoes on it, 
and right before the, the, the cheesy goodness enters my mouth, my mother again says, Amy, drop that fork. If John's hungry, he'll feed himself. Hmm. <laughs> Jay, wow. I remember looking at my mom in awe and astoundment, thinking, what is she you talking about? I, I can't, first of all, and haven't I been through enough? Yeah. By the end of the night, the table had been cleared. My siblings had left. My father was putting them to bed. At one side was my mom. On the other side was her son with plates of food, food spilt out in front of her. But there was a little boy with tears in his eyes, angry at what she was making him do, with a fork wedged between his fingers, bringing the goodness up to his mouth eating. And I remember thinking with great hatred and disdain that day, you ruined my dinner, Mom. You ruined huh. my dinner, Mom. Maybe. you know. But, but this is evidence of tough love. She gave me a choice. She knew it would not be easy. I'm sure it broke her heart. We've talked about it many times since. It was one of the harder decisions she made for me during that recovery. But by the end of that night, late May 1987, there was a little bandaged boy smiling again as he finished the last bit of his plate eating for himself. It, it's a lesson that she taught me with tough love. It's one that I've never forgotten. In an age of helicopter parents and everything, the, the contrast is so stark for what your mom was brave enough to do to let you kind of, you know, battle through it and know that you could do it yourself. My wife does this to me every now with my kids. You know, it's like when you take over, you know, through impatience or fear for them, mm -hmm. you're subtly communicating to them that you don't believe they can do it. Mm -hmm. And the belief that she had that you could figure this out for yourself. Um, again, I just, you know, kudos to your mom for being the parent we all want to be. Um, but aren't always as courageous as we can and in, in, in a really horrible situation. Now, you had someone else, like the second lesson um, that we really kind of took from the book, and hopefully I'm connecting the dots from the seven choices here properly, was this, this one connection, one gift. There was someone else that visited you, um, a baseball announcer, who also <laughs> challenged you to kind of take some ownership and control over some outcomes. Yeah. So, and, and the point number two, I think where it speaks so beautifully is how he found out. So remind me as I tell the story to also share, well, how did he learn about it? Sure. Because I think it's a remarkable, miraculous aspect of the power of one and our ability as listeners to your podcast and leaders in life to be that power for those around us. So, so we'll kind of leave that out there as a carrot. So hang on for it. Okay. But, but uh you got to understand when you're burned so severely, what happens almost immediately, mom and dad love on you. They get chased out of that room, and then the staff just torpedoes in. The room fills with people that you've never met before. They begin wrapping you uh, pretty quickly into a jag. I'm unable to breathe anymore for myself because my lungs have been burned. Mm. So they have to put a hole in my neck. It's called a trach, of course. They, they were forced to tie me down to the bed, arms and legs, kind of spread eagle, so I can't move my arms or my legs. It's to control contractures and movement. But it also means I can't move my body now for the next five months. And the final challenge that I faced was swelling. My, my little body doubled in size overnight. So when the sun rose on Sunday morning, my little eyes weren't able to see it. So I'm laying there, nine years old, dying in pain, broken and sad, victim to it all, unable to do a thing, except think and reflect and pray and dream and imagine and hear. You know, when your eyes are shut, it's a beautiful aspect of life. When your eyes are shut, you hear more clearly. And many of us, we race so fast through life that we very seldom pause to really hear what's going on around us and within us. But, but I had months to just kind of pay attention. Well, growing up in St. Louis, Missouri, there, there's basically one thing that we love. It's baseball. I mean, we're a huge baseball nation up here in St. Louis, and the way we used to watch baseball was not with our eyes, actually, but through our ears on the radio. The voice we had was a guy named Jack Buck, this bigger-than-life Hall of Fame celebrity, broadcaster for the Cardinals, my hero. I never met the, the, the gentleman, but I looked up to him. I loved him. I loved that voice. I got burned on a Saturday morning and Sunday afternoon, Jay, I'm laying, tied down, dying in darkness, and then my door opens up. The first thing I hear is footsteps, and then I hear a chair, and then I hear a cough, 
and then I hear this bigger than life voice booming into my room, bringing light into the darkness, not, not from the radio, but from the chair right next to me. And the voice says loud and clear, kid, wake up, wake <laughs> up. You are going to live. You are going to survive. And when you get out of here, we are going to celebrate. We'll call it John O'Leary Day at the ballpark. Wow. Keep fighting. And then he gets up and he leaves. And that's it. That, that one visit, my friend, quiet literally changed my life. I'll never forget it. I can't tell you the importance of it, but it's, it's indescribable what that visit did for that little boy in the pain that I was suffering that day. And that ties to this idea, one act, one connection, one gift. So here's this guy that you really looked up to. He hears about you, and you have to tell us how he heard about you within 24 hours. But he makes a decision to take probably an hour out of his life and just visit you to encourage you. That little yeah. act that was so important at a moment that, you know, in the hero's journey, as my kids talk about, it might have been your darkest hour. So how did he hear about you? Perfect. So the night before, uh, he was at a charity auction. January 17th, 1987, there's a charity auction going on in St. Louis. He gets seated next to an old Cardinal player, and now a Hall of Fame second baseman, former manager for the Cardinals. The old-time ball fans will know this name, but Red Shandings. Hmm. Red Shandings happens to sit next to his friend Jack, and in passing, he mentions that a little boy today was burned in St. Louis, and to keep the little boy in his thoughts and prayers. So now I hope the question that you're thinking about and your listeners are asking is, well, how did Red Shandings hear? <laughs> Red Shandings had a daughter named Colleen. Colleen had called her father right before he left for a charity auction that night and whispered to him, by the way, a little boy was burned in, in our community. Pray for him, Dad. Hmm. How, how did Colleen hear? Colleen heard from a lady who I don't know, but I know that lady was told by my next-door neighbor who called this go-between, who called Colleen, who told Red, who sat next to Jack. So, so the power of what one began with an explosion in the garage that woke up my neighbor quite literally, called a friend who called her friend who told her father who told his friend. And the following day, in the midst of a snowstorm in St. Louis, and you can't make stuff like this up without getting in trouble at some point, yeah. it's snowing. Jack Buck hops into his Lincoln Town car, and I promise you it's more than an hour. You, you can't do anything in an hour anymore drives from his home to a hospital, not even sure which one it is, not sure what the name of the patient is, takes the elevator right up to the fourth floor, the burn center, which is the worst place in first world living. I mean, it's, it's a horrible place. Walks down the hallway, goes into a room, scrubs in, walks in, and brings encouragement, changes my life. The, the, the power of one, it's not just Jack, it's Red and Colleen and the unknown person and my next door neighbor and each one of us in our lives. I can say this for the folks listening in, like the takeaway for me when you first shared this story is that no act is too small to change a life. And we talk about these, you know, these simple acts of kindness and there's, it feels trite and cliche, but the reality is, um, Choosing to act, choosing to try to make a difference, no matter how small, can absolutely, asking for a prayer, right, in this case. Think about someone in our community. That simple act can create a chain reaction that's far bigger than that. Right, and then I think what we do next matters. I think this is where bullet point two and bullet point three kind of play as one. When Jack left after that first visit, Jay, uh, I, I learned this part of the story years later, but he broke down in the hallway. And it's just it's a tragic, a mummified little boy in a trach that can't move. It's a horrible thing to imagine. So he leaves this. He starts crying. One of the nurses walks over to the only celebrity in St. Louis, Missouri. She gets down on her, knee, her knees, looks up, and says, Mr. Buck, are you okay? And the gentleman says, I'm not sure. The little kid won't make it, will he? And the nurse apparently says back to him, Mr. Buck, there is absolutely not a chance. Wow. So this is the diagnosis he gets in this situation, and we all get situations like this in our life, whether it's around, you know, you showed that beautiful graph earlier, the one things to focus on professionally, financially, spiritually, in our health, in our relationships, whatever. 
we get the diagnosis that there's not a chance in these areas, and then what do we do next? Well, what this guy does is he takes it home, and he cries, he prays, he reflects, and he journals on the question, what more can I do? The following day, a little boy named John O'Leary is tied down in a hospital bed dying, and his door opens up, and I hear footsteps, and then I hear a chair, and then I hear a cough, and then I hear a voice that says, kid, wake up, hmm. wake up, I'm back. You are going to live, you are going to survive, keep fighting. When you get out of here, we are going to celebrate. We'll call it John O'Leary Day at the ballpark. See you soon. And, and Jay, we could extend this conversation out much longer than the allotted time, but those visits from that man continued almost daily for the five months that I was in the hospital. One guy coming into a little boy's world, bringing a little bit of encouragement, a little bit of possibility, and changing him for the better. Changed my life forever. Maybe your mom put him up to this or maybe they're cut from the same cloth, but like he kind of was like saying, let's get you some signed baseballs, but he <laughs> made you write the letters, right? Like, I'm not going to write the letter for you. You have to write the letter. And this is someone who has no fingers left. Yeah. D d do me a favor and, and uh, put the picture of Jack Buck on there real quick. He's the older gentleman by himself uh, with the stadium behind him. So that that's a picture of Jack. Uh, he kept his promise, and if you go down two pictures from there, you'll see John O'Leary day at the ballpark. Uh, go up one where you see a picture of an old uh, ball player that and you? a little guy. There we go. There I am. Wow. So that's John O'Leary day at the ballpark. He kept the promise, and I, I think we could spend a whole another segment of your show talking about keeping promises. Because <laughs> it's actually in life really easy to say, I'll be there for you at 10 o'clock, Jay. Or we'll be on time for the 3 o'clock podcast or whatever you want to say. But it's all cheap talk if it's not backed up with action. Jack Buck was a great visionary, but what made him a great leader is he kept the promise continuously throughout his entire life, including to a little nobody kid named John O'Leary in St. Louis County for John O'Leary Day at the ballpark. While there that night, he learned this little kid had a big, big goofy grin, but, but really nothing else going for him. Uh, I'm not able... toes, third degree, it's a broken situation, and yet he sees the weakness, but also the possibility. He takes it home and cries and prays and asks this great question, what more can I do? And the following day, to your point, he realizes baseball. So if you put the next picture up of the ball signed by Ozzie Smith. who And I'm not even from St. Louis, but Ozzie Smith with his backflips was a huge hero of mine too. So oh, that's man. a big deal. And for me, too, certainly, below the ball from Ozzy was a note that read, Kid, if you want a second baseball, all you have to do is send a thank you letter to the man who signed the first. Wow. Which he, he knew, Jay, I could not do. And yet he also knew the power of motivation, of purpose, of hammering that same nail, of staying focused on a worthy purpose. And for a nine-year-old little kid, man, in St. Louis, Missouri, the idea of getting a second baseball signed by a player, man, that, that is worthy. For, for those of you who love quotes, and I'm, I'm a quote lover, I have them hanging all over my life, but if you want to write something down, this is one of my favorite quotes. The quote is, when you know your why, you can endure any how. When you know your why, you can endure any how. So with the help, again, of my mom and dad and now a couple physical therapists, I'm writing a note to Ozzy Smith. We mail it off, and two days later, I got a second baseball with a second note that said, kid, if you want a third baseball, and then kid, if you want a fourth baseball, and then kid, if you want a fifth baseball, and you see the picture in front of you right now if you're looking at the webinar. That summer, Jack Buck sent a little kid in a wheelchair, nine years old, 60 baseballs. Wow. Six zero teaching a little guy how to grab a pen, grab life, ride it again, and take a mighty step toward normalcy. I love it. It's inspirational, right? That's how, I mean, this, this is one of the ways that Jack Buck was choosing significance. When to, I want to just remind our audience, we have hundreds of people on this call, and if you have a question you would like me to ask John, Use the questions toolbar and please put it in there. Um, this is an inspirational message. It's not as much of our usual lessons, but I'm hearing lessons learned 
Um, and I have a question already ready to go for, for John. So definitely be adding those in so that when we go to Q&A here in about five minutes, we'll be able to answer your specific questions. So you made a decision. Um, and if I'm, if I get this slightly wrong, John, forgive me, but it was kind of after your parents wrote the book that you could also be on this journey of significance. Um, it awesome. shocked me when we were talking saying that this is not something that you really talked about, um, until really kind of recent history in, in the grand yes. scheme of things. So when, when you're burned as bad as I was at nine, the goal is first to get out of the hospital. The second goal is to have John O'Leary date the ballpark. The third might be the trip to Colorado. But at some point, the trip becomes, the journey becomes, the dream becomes, this may sound surprising to you, but about being normal. Mm -hmm. So the great goal, if you can imagine, of my life at age 9, 10, 11, and until the age of 27 was to be normal, to fit in, and, and candidly, to disappear, to kind of just wear gray and be like everybody else. When you don't have fingers, when you're scarred from your neck to your toes, you don't want to stand out. You want to fit in. And then my mom and dad, after I was married, realized that the tragedy they endured with their little boy at age nine was not tragic. It was actually triumphant. And so they wrote a little book. You referenced it in your, in your opening. They printed a book called Overwhelming Odds. They printed 200 copies, essentially, for their church. They have to date sold more than 65,000 copies of Overwhelming Odds. And one of the copies they sold was to your guest today, a fellow named John O'Leary. Hmm. This unauthorized biography, I had to buy my own apparently. <laughs> so for you know a, a small investment, I, I learned again about what happened to me as a kid. And I get to the end of the story that I'd always viewed as being terrible and tragic and disabling. I look back to the picture on the front of the cover and realize for the first time that all of it was a gift that the brokenness, that the scars, that the challenges, that the uphill climbs, that all of it was this absolute remarkable blessing that I had never fully embraced. It, the fire led to who I am today. It led to the, the strength and formation of faith and character and grit. It led to where I went to college, which led to a chance encounter with a brunette with brown eyes named Elizabeth Grace, who has gifted me with four kids. The, the best of my life today is the direct result of being burned as a kid back then, and I never knew it. And uh, I'm uh, going, we showed the pictures of you on the hospital bed. I want to show the happy pictures um, of you with your bride and then you surrounded by your family, you know, <laughs> all odds. I just think that is so uplifting that, you know, you've, you've managed to have this inspired life coming from such a place and... And, and, and it's just, it, I totally get wanting to disappear when this is what your life looks like and not wanting to be the burned kid anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but being the burned kid now has allowed you to inspire, I'm going to guess hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, more. Yeah. So it started uh, about nine years ago now, Jay. And then the first call was from three Girl Scouts, third graders. I remember being terrified, but in, in in life, when an opportunity presents itself, my answer always is yes. So I, I said yes to these three scouts. One of them had a father who was a Rotarian. So six months later, I'm in front of 19 Rotarians. A few months later, in front of about 11 Qantas members. So in one year, I shared the story three times. The second year, maybe eight. It was never about the finances. It was always about the passion, the purpose, and the drive to wake people up to the possibility of their lives, to wake up from accidental living and to start living a radically inspired life. That that was the drive back then. It remains the drive today. So yes, we have been blessed to be in front of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people all around the United States, now all around the world. Uh, we wrote the book, you know, even, even that. I never considered myself an author. But when Simon & Schuster asked if I might be willing to pen this book, I said yes, spent years reflecting and praying over it. It came onto the marketplace on March 15th. It's known as a number one instant national bestseller because it has nothing to do with me. It has to do with community and life and love and what happens when people move past themselves and serve those around them. So it's, it's just a beautiful love story. I happen to be the recipient of it, learning the lessons of it, and then how we can put this into play in our own businesses and in our own lives. I love it. And you pull in that book. We covered three wonderful takeaways here, but you cover seven choices in that book. And so I would definitely encourage people to check it out. And uh, 
I, I almost said support your ministry because this almost feels like a ministry <laughs> to me, right? Um, a spiritual calling to help people and inspire them. We've got about 10 minutes left, John. Are you okay? Um, really quickly, I, at the end of this, I'm going to ask you for any final inspirational thoughts. But are you okay if we just answer a few of these questions before we move um, and let people get back to their daily lives a, a lot oh, more yeah. inspired than they started? Absolutely. Humbled. Okay. Awesome. Well, the first one um, is from Andy. He says, John, your why was largely defined for you to fight and to live or not to die. Most of us will thankfully not suffer as you have. What advice do you have for us on how to find your why? Awesome. Andy. Andy, I agree. It's an awesome question. I actually think it's way easier to have someone else force you to do things. It, it, like for me, physical therapy is a great example. I would have never chosen to have my joints stretched in a broom closet, right? I mean, that, that's not something you choose for yourself. But having therapists come in and demand it from you is actually an easy way to stretch forward in life. So Andy's point is right on. It's well, easier when things because they haven't read the book. You were in the broom closet because your screams were so right. loud; they were trying to, to to buffer it from the other patients. So totally, I mean, oh, it, it's it's an that was a story, hard but... read. The the other side of the coin is ultimately you get out of the broom closet, you get out of the hospital bed, you get back into life, and you get to decide what kind of a life do I want to live today for myself and for those I serve. And so the question I would encourage Andy and all of your listeners, including both you and me, Jay, to ask is, why will I choose to thrive today? And then usually the answer begins with the word, because. So why will I choose to thrive today? And you'll answer it because. And then you'll, I would encourage you, ask it again tomorrow. Then ask it again the following day. And then the following day. And then the following day. And after a, a week, a month, three years, at some point, you will have discovered your why or your mission statement for life. And so I'd like to share with you guys what mine is. Because my mom and dad aren't making me do this anymore. And the physical therapists aren't making me do it anymore. It's a choice that we make each day through omission and commission. So my reason for thriving each day now is because, for me, God demands it. My family deserves it, and the world is starved for it. That lights me up, whether I'm working, I'm playing, I'm swimming with the kids in the backyard, I'm serving somebody in the community, I'm on a, a conference call with UJ, I'm going through TSA, I'm jet lagged, whatever. <laughs> because God demands it, my family deserves it, and the world is starved for it. That may light up some of your listeners, it may turn them off as well. Ideally, though, it eventually will become theirs, and the way they make it their own is to ask the question, why do I choose to thrive today? No, oh, I love that. When people get in touch with their mission, their purpose, they really do become unstoppable. And um, I've shared mine before on these, you know, and mine kind of rolls all downhill to being a great husband and a father, and I connect all my successes and failures to that, like barfy cheesy. Like, I, it, it can definitely turn some people's stomach. But the point is, yours is yours, mine is mine, and our listeners have theirs, and they just have to discover it. Whatever it is becomes their own inspiration. So I love that. Just keep asking the question, do it every day, and there's going to be a pattern that emerges. So let me get another couple of questions in. This is from Carmen. Um, I'm going to paraphrase this. Um, what do you recommend you know, in terms of to-do steps to take when you are feeling stuck in one place in your life that affects all else? Awesome. There are three questions that I ask myself every day, and I would suggest whether you know it or not, you're also asking yourself. Uh, and the wild thing about these three questions is they show up both under the accountability heading and also the victim heading. So let's take it down the victim's path first. The three victim's questions that we ask when we choose to be victims to life or choose to remain stuck longer than we have to is why me, who cares, and what more can I do? Why me, oh, bad luck. Who cares? Arms crossed to indifference all around us. And then what more can I do? It's a big world. I can't do a doggone thing. Well, alternatively, we can ask these questions through the lens of accountability, or what I might refer to as the, the victor's tone. And when we ask it over here, we say, why me? And I would begin each morning by asking the question from a sense of gratitude with why me? Why am I so blessed? Why am I so lucky? Why do I get to do this thing today? Why do I get a second chance to do today better than I did yesterday? Well, that's really cool if you think about it. Why me? I, I take about only 60 seconds and make my list. My only rule is I can't have the same list two days in a row. So it's a new list every day. As I go through the day now, my arms are uncrossed to possibility in front of me. So I ask the question, who cares? 
if I have some scars, or if I sweat a little bit more than more people, or if there are long lines through TSA this summer because everybody and their mother are traveling. Who cares? Man, I'm about to go from St. Louis to California in two hours and 10 minutes flat. I am fortunate, so who cares? I'm on mission. I'm choosing to thrive. And then the third and the final question that I encourage your followers, Jay, to ask every night, faithfully, it's the Jack Buck question. We, we hinted at this earlier, but it's what more can I do? What more can I do to ensure tomorrow is even better than today? And you get to point this thing in any direction you choose, that, that one thing. Maybe it's professionally. Maybe it's faithfully. Maybe it's for a relationship or a marriage or a child or your health or your finances or in the community or for yourself. But what more can I do to ensure tomorrow is better than today? And I, I promise you, if you decide to actively ask these three questions each day, take the one week O'Leary challenge, man. You ask those three questions for one week, your life will be radically different in eight days than it is today. All right. Repeat them right back in order for me. Why me? Yep. Why me? Gratitude list. Who cares? Which frees you to uncross your arms and do the hard thing, even if it's painful. And then finally, what more can I do to ensure tomorrow's better than today? Wow. All right. That's great. And what's great is we had a question from Tom who heard you in Fort Worth who was hoping you would tie in that series to this speech. So you just knocked out two birds with one stone. Wait a minute. <laughs> um, I'm going to jump to Jessica. Um, this is a great one. As a military spouse, I find myself trying to reignite the fire in my husband. He's always <laughs> fighting against negativity. Any advice on how not to get burned out? So for, let me just tell Jessica that I love her, and we, our family prays for her and hers every single day. I have the opportunity of serving wounded veterans, and last month, Jay, I had the opportunity to speak at, at JSOC. It's, it's a Joint Special Operations Command. These are the SEALs. These are the Rangers. These are the tough guys. But I wasn't speaking to them. I was actually speaking to their spouses, which for me was even more special. Yes, the SEALs were there. Yes, the Rangers were there. Yes, Delta Force was there but so were the spouses. Mm -hmm. And the people I found to be most inspirational in the room weren't those who are most often recognized on, ta on television and in movies and in books, but the spouses, the ones who stay at home and do the laundry and make the meals while everyone else is out there getting the glory and doing the, doing the work. And so I just, I, I love Jessica, I love her heart. And my first encouragement for her was she can't make anybody else do what they won't do for themselves. I think frequently we try to take care of people to the finish line. And my encouragement for Jessica is to be that example. Don't try to teach it, don't try to preach it, but model it, become it, exemplify it, and through your action, through your life, through your love, it's gonna draw him back up to the possibility in his own life. Wow, that's a great answer. I mean, I, that's fantastic. And thank you, Jessica for asking it because I think we're all a little inspired and, and I wholeheartedly agree about the brave people who are left behind. Um, so that's wonderful. I've got something from Nehemiah. Um, thanks you for the inspiration. And he, go, he he's curious, where did you find business work after you realized you could live again in the mid thirties? And how did mm. you deal with the challenges of learning, you know, those basic skills again? Awesome. So Nehemiah, first, I love your name and what it represents. And then secondly, if you're a normal kid and you're faking your way to make it all the way through life, I did not have to wait till my mid-30s to get a real job. I went to high school and college, and when I graduated college, I started my own business. And Jay, if you can think of the worst business for a guy that does not sweat anywhere other than his face and has no fingers to do, uh, carpentry might be at the top of the list. <laughs> and so, of course, a guy who is faking his way through life, that's what, exactly what I did. I became a carpenter, then a general contractor, then a real estate developer here in St. Louis. I faked my way through that career, and I realized looking back on it, standing on top of the ladder, it was my way of yelling at the world, look how normal I am. Watch me work. Watch me impact. Watch me thrive, which is okay, but it's unhealthy if you're, if you're not even aware that that's why you're doing it. So I did, I did real estate development for a decade looking for greater meaning in my life. I became a hospital chaplain for three years working with kids. I had an absolute blast working with kids, man. I mean, if you can't get up lifting and serving and listening and eating ice cream with kids as they are enduring chemo treatments and surgeries and everything else, uh, then your heart's not beating. So they inspired me in ways that I can't even share on this call. 
and then eventually my mom and dad would write their book. I would get called into this role of being a speaker. It's one that I joined haltingly with great trepidation. But once I embraced it, made an all in play faithfully to say yes to it and have tried to become a little bit better at presenting every day than the day before. Well, that's a big, big story. Part of your journey, the takeaway is how those little improvements every day um, add up to a lot to getting out of the hospital after 18 months and regaining all those things. So you are an inspiration, my friend. Um, thank you so much. I actually, people just stopped asking questions and we got about 10 people just saying, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, it's hard on these to know that you're making an impact, but I'm telling you that people are, um, truer words were never spoken from Linda. People are appreciative of the message that you shared today. Um, as are we. So thank you so, so much. Any final words of wisdom for folks? Wow. Um, well, that's a big one, Jay. But you know what? How about this? My, my physician, when I was in the hospital, after amputating my fingers, I thought he took my life from me. You know, I mean, I was going to be the short set for the Cardinals for, you know, my 20s and 30s, and now I know I'm never going to play baseball again. Near midnight, the day he takes my fingers, he comes back into my room. His name was Dr. Avajan. He sits down next to me, and he says to me, John, I, I know why you're mad. I know why you're sad, and I don't blame you for being angry, angry with me. But he says to me, I have not taken your life today. I've given it to you. And then he gave me three examples of things that I may not be able to do and three examples that now I could. So he specifically called out, you may not be able to be a court reporter, <laughs> but you can become a judge or you can become an attorney. He said, you may not be able to play baseball for the St. Louis Cardinals, but you can become their manager or you can become their owner. And he even said, you may not be able to become a carpenter, but you, be, you, can, become a general carp you can become a general contractor or an architect. John, I've not taken your life today. I may have just given it back to you. And then he said, but you need to know this, John. Your best days are yet to come. That, <laughs> wow. I'm hearing it again. This is from a guy who's been on his feet for 20 hours. Earlier in the day, he took my fingers. Who knows what he did throughout his day? He's wiped out. He's spent, but not too tired to spend a couple moments at the end of his long day with a little boy whose life he's about to change one final time. And so, my friends, as you race back off to your work and your lives and your challenges and your opportunities, I, I remind you it may not be always perfect, but it is worth it. It's certainly worth the fight. And in the words of Dr. Vachia Vajan, the best is yet to come. Go fight for it and God bless. Wow, John. Thank you so much again. Hey, everybody, um, as you go back to work, please, you'll get um, a copy of this webinar sent to you so you can share it with your friends. Um, watch it again if you want to. It'll be in the next 24 hours. Also, please take that survey so we can find out how to better serve you. And that's often where we get suggestions for our guests. Um, our webinar archives are on our website in webinars. And next month, mark your calendars for July 28th. We're gonna have Ryan Levesque. And if you don't know who he is, we're gonna get back to our marketing theme. He is the guy in terms of how to engage the people who are your followers. And his book is called Ask. And we'll be learning a little bit about how we can enrich the communities that we've built and really engage our tribe. Um, that being said, final words, you can reach out to us online. There's John's hashtag again, J O'Leary Inspires on Twitter. Um, I'll be there as well. Please reach out to us if we didn't to your, get to your questions. And thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next month.